So, um, did you play this game? Anyone? Yeah. It's uh, the very first uh, civilization game uh, released in uh, 1991. I, I played this game a lot uh, as a kid. Uh, of course, I was only one year old when it was first released, but uh, I played it later in, in one of those emulators. Uh, I, it was probably 15 or 16 years ago since I last played this game, but uh, so I, I can't remember much from the game besides it being a very fun and addictive game. But uh, there's one thing I, I can remember quite vividly. In the game, uh, Gandhi wasn't quite the peace advocate that uh, we all remember him by. Uh, instead of using peaceful methods to get his way, he would uh, employ atomic bombs and uh, nuke his enemies. Uh, back then, I didn't really get the irony of that. Um, but today, I think it's hilarious thinking of Gandhi nuking other nations. And what makes this even funnier is that he would be pretty much himself in other regards. He would be very friendly and diplomatic, but as soon as you would upset him just a little, he would uh, bring out the nukes and destroy you. So when you see stuff like this, you gotta think it's intentional from some uh, game developer with a twisted mind. But uh, the truth is that this was, oh, Okay, <laughs> this was uh, actually caused by a bug uh, in the game. Every leader in the game had a set of different traits, and uh, one, of, uh, one of them was aggressiveness. Gandhi has uh, an aggressiveness of one, the lowest possible value, naturally making him very unaggressive. The problem starts when democracy introduced in the game, because that lowers uh, every leader's aggressiveness automatically by two. <laughs> so, you would think that this would maybe uh, set his aggressiveness to minus one, or maybe not change it at all, but uh, this value was stored as an unsigned 8-bit integer. And what happens when you reduce one by two with an unsigned integer? You get an integer overflow and the number wraps around all the way to the top, setting the value to 255, making Gandhi a warmongering psychopath. <laughs> uh, sorry about the lack of uh, parenthesis here. Uh, this is supposed to show the problem in uh, Go. <clears throat> the game was apparently found after the game had, uh, the, the bug was uh, apparently found after the game had been released, and uh, the game studio found it to be so hilarious that they uh, decided to keep it as a feature in all subsequent Civilization games. Uh, I also think it's a very funny bug, but it's also pretty interesting because it doesn't really cause any errors in the game. Uh, you know, the, the game works perfectly fine without New King Gandhi. It isn't until a human actually plays the game and senses that something's wrong because of the behavior of the game. And, uh, that kind of bug can be very tricky to find. Or it's actually not tricky to find because your users will find it for you, but you want the hard part, the hard part is to find it before your users. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, that's exactly what we're going to talk about here today. Um, and with a specific focus on user interfaces. User interfaces can of course mean uh, very very different thing, we all come uh, different environments. So it could be the front of a web, web application or a phone application, could be the buttons of a microwave or uh, the dashboard in your car. Uh, but if I would be here only speaking in generalities, you would all be asleep pretty soon. So uh, my focus is mostly, um, I, I work mostly with web applications, so that's uh, what my focus is gonna be today. <clears throat> Uh, but uh, I, I hope that you can get some inspiration from this talk and uh, bring that to uh, your environment as well. Uh, I have divided this talk into two different sections or parts, and uh, the first one is property-based testing, and the other one is uh, simulation testing. Uh, 
some may argue that simulation testing is a kind of property-based testing, but I hope that this, this distinction will be uh, pretty, pretty clear in, uh, in this talk. Uh, I have instead used generative testing as kind of an umbrella term for uh, these testing methods. Uh, but we are going to start with this one, uh, property-based testing. So uh, before we do that, I wanna do a quick poll. How many in here uh, know how to use uh, test.check? Okay, uh, quite a few of you, and that, that looks really promising. How many in here are actually using test.check or any similar library to, uh, um, in, in their projects as part of their test suite? Not that many. Okay, uh, I, I sort of expected that, and um, I, think, uh, I think that's a problem, and I hope that uh, this talk will uh, show you uh, some new areas where you can use this, this uh, testing technique. <clears throat> and uh, those of you who didn't raise their uh, hand in the first question, don't worry, I will have a short introduction to uh, test that check. Um, and uh, those of you who did raise their arm, this introduction might be uh, pretty boring for you. Uh, so uh, feel free to take a nap or something. Okay, so uh, test that check. It's uh, probably um, uh, the library most of us use in Clojure to uh, do property-based testing. It's inspired by uh, QuickChat, which uh, originally came from Haskell. And the idea is that you uh, tell test.check what kind of data you want, and test.check will then generate examples of that data. And you can then use those examples as input for the, um, the operation you want to test. Uh, and for the actual testing, you will uh, set up a few properties that need to uh, hold true for all those inputs. Uh, and that, that's why it's called property-based testing, because you test properties of uh, your operation. Um, and this is opposed to, um, opposed to uh, example-based testing, where you come up with examples yourself and um, uh, give those input uh, this as input to your operation, and uh, then just basically just check the result. Um, and I, I think this is uh, uh, best explained with a demonstration. So let's say we want to check a zip map. Zip map takes uh, two collections, the first one uh, being uh, the keys of a map, and the other one uh, being uh, the values. And it will then uh, return a map by mapping the keys to the values. So a property for this function might be um, that the number of uh, keys or values should match the uh, uh, number of key value pairs we get back uh, in the map. So here we have uh, two keys, for example, and we have two key value pairs. <clears throat> uh, so that makes sense, right? Let's uh, have a look at uh, a test for that. If we start from the top, we uh, uh, call something uh, called dev spec, which is uh, basically test.checks uh, dev test. And uh, we call our test zip map size. And uh, then we have the number 100. This means that we will run this test 100 times. Uh, you could just put any number in there. You could put a million times or Five. Um, it it just uh, it depends on how long time you want to spend uh, testing this property. And uh, then we call something uh, called uh, for all. Uh, and um, I will show you more of that in the next slide. And inside the uh, for all, uh, we perform our actual test. And as you can see here, um, we. Um, we count the number of uh, key value paths in the uh, in the map we get back from zip map and uh, compare that with the lowest uh, value of uh, keys or values because uh, if uh, if they wouldn't be the same size um, the uh, the zip map function will return as 
as soon as any of them uh, is uh, empty. So uh, for this, um, uh, for all function here, as you can see on the right, we uh, call something uh, called vector distinct, and uh, we hand that something called uh, keyword. And the gen thing here is uh, the generator generator's uh, namespace in Tessa check. So this will uh, produce um, a distinctive vector of uh, keywords. The first one will do that for the keys, and the uh, other one will uh, uh, give us a vector of natural numbers. And uh, it will then uh, map uh, those, uh, or it will, uh, yeah, it will map those uh, vectors to the keys and vowels names for every iteration in this test. So if we look at uh, some examples of, uh, of generated uh, uh, vectors, we have at the top uh, the keys here, uh, and it's uh, just uh, random, uh, random um, vectors with random um, keywords. And uh, at the bottom we have uh, random vectors of random uh, natural numbers. So if we will actually run this test, our uh, test result might look something like this. And uh, as you can see, uh, result true. We didn't find any, uh, any problems with uh, the zip map implementation in Clojure. We ran it for 100 times, and uh, then we have a seed, and we can use that seed if we want to run exactly the same test uh, uh, again. So here is the code for the zip map um, implementation in Clojure, and it's pretty straightforward. It uh, takes uh, two, uh, vec uh, two, um, two collections, and uh, it will just uh, loop over those collections until any of them uh, is empty and uh, return the resulting map. If you look at line number five here, uh, you can see that this is uh, the actual check uh, where, we, uh, where we either um, decide to keep on looping or return the map. So, if we would change that to uh, that and to or, we would just uh, keep on looping until um, both collections is empty are empty, uh, and that will practically mean if uh, if the keys are uh, if the size of the keys are uh, uh, if the size of the keys is more than the vowels, uh, we will just have um, uh, keys mapping to nil vowels basically. So if we run uh, this test again with uh, this new implementation, it would look something like this. It, fall, uh, it uh, failed. And um, uh, this, uh, this, um, the test runner will actually return more stuff than this, but I, I picked out the most important parts, I think. Uh, in the middle, we have something called failed, and that, uh, that is the first failing test case. And uh, I think the more uh, important part of this is uh, the smallest thing we have over there. Because uh, it will just, uh, as soon as it encounters a failure, it won't just uh, return. It will keep on uh, try to uh, find more failures and try to shrink that first failing test case down to something that's maybe more understandable for us. And in this case, it's uh, very much uh, so. So in here, this basically means that we will have uh, the keys. We only have a single key with a single character and a, an empty vector of values. And uh, that, that makes sense, right? Uh, it will fail for this. Uh, before we move on, I just want to show you another another uh, spec here. Here we test uh, subtraction with positive integers. So for all positive integers, x and y, uh, x minus y is um, less than or equal to x, right? Does this uh, look familiar to anyone? It's the 
scan this aggressiveness test, right? This is the test they should have had in place. Anyway, uh, that was uh, test that check 101 in five minutes. Uh, and um, there's definitely a load uh, of more useful features in there. Um, but I think this will be enough for this talk. Um, so if you have any snoring neighbors, just uh, give them a kick in the ankle and we'll move on to the more interesting stuff. So uh, for this talk, I made up a, uh, a modest online store for selling ice cream. Uh, don't try to use it, uh, because I, I promise you I won't ship you any ice cream. Uh, or if you want to use it, uh, I, I, if you want to pay for imaginary ice cream, I, I'm not going to stop you. Um, Anyway, uh, what you basically can do is you can browse through the different uh, products. Uh, you can uh, post comments on them. You can uh, add them to your cart. And um, you can go through the, through the checkout process. Uh, so throughout the rest of this talk, I'm uh, going to use this to uh, kind of demonstrate the, the tests uh, I have. OK, so uh, story time. A while back, I was working on uh, on an application, and uh, we had just released, and everything was going great. Uh, but one day, we uh, we got um, we got this weird bug report from a user, and we didn't really think that much about it because we just uh, assumed that it was the user's fault, like it always is. And um, yeah, we we just uh, kept on and. I think it was maybe the next day or something like that, or maybe the day after that, we got more very similar bug reports. And they all uh, said that sometimes when they tried to post a comment on a certain item, they uh, just got this generic uh, failure. And uh, they got an error message to, which was very generic, saying basically it couldn't post comment. Uh, so we started to look at the logs, couldn't really find anything there, uh, tried to talk to the users uh, and uh, tried to look at the code uh, to see if there was anything in there that might be triggered uh, occasionally. But yeah, it was, it was hard to find this bug. It was a pretty big application and uh, yeah, a lot of code to uh, go through. Uh, but eventually we found it uh, after a considerable, considerable amount of hours. And I'm just... I'm not going to show you uh, the, uh, the bug right away. Instead, I have implemented it in, in this uh, application. So uh, the idea is that we are going to, um, we're going to make a property-based test to uh, find this bug and see how quickly we can find it. So this is basically what we're going to do. Um, for every comment we post, we just gonna assert that it was really posted. Sorry. So um, this is um, the um, this is the test for that. There is actually um, a lot of more code, uh, and I I uh, I kind of. Uh, hit it away in uh, completely unnecessary functions, uh, but I, I couldn't fit all the code in one slide. So, uh, but I, I think it will make sense. So we are going to generate uh, non-empty uh, random ASCII strings for our comments, and uh, then we are going to find the strawberry function, and then we call the post comment function, which will uh, basically just navigate to that product and uh, post the comment. And uh, then we'll try to find the comment in the database. And uh, if we did find it, we will just remove it again and move on to the next iteration. If we didn't find it, the, uh, the if, let, if let statement here will um, uh, return nil, and uh, the test will, that will indicate to test.check that uh, this, uh, this iteration failed. So let's look what uh, that will look like. Yeah, this will <laughs> keep on going for a while. 
I was actually pretty lucky when I recorded this because I ran it two times before recording this and each, each time it took about 10 or 15 minutes to find the bug. And uh, in this recording, uh, it took uh, one minute, I think. Uh, so you can get lucky, uh, but we, we will not, uh, we will just skip on to the, to the result. And as we expected, it failed. And these are all the uh, generated test cases. And what's, uh, what's interesting about this one is that you can, you can kind of see where the um, uh, shrinking kicks in around here, right? It just narrows down from there. So this is our first failing test case. And this is our minimal failing test case. Apparently, deep down in some uh, code of some internal framework we were using, we had this script injection, very smart script injection uh, validation happening, and uh, it didn't trigger any specific error, and uh, you couldn't post a less than character. Yeah. So, as I mentioned, this required quite an effort to track this down. Um, by just looking and reasoning about the code. Uh, but if we would have the infrastructure set up for doing property-based integration tests, uh, we could have found it by uh, just uh, implementing this test in like 10, 10 minutes and then run, running this uh, test for yeah, one minute to 15 minutes. So uh, I think property-based testing is a very powerful tool for um, reproducing bugs, even if the bug report is very vague, as in this case. And um, we can also use it to find bugs, which uh, uh, we didn't previously know about. So uh, what do you need to, to do this kind of test yourself? Uh, you need uh, Selenium or uh, something similar. It depends on uh, what environment you are in, but you need something uh, that you can use to uh, programmatically interact with your user interface. Um, we obviously need test.check or some similar library, and uh, we need a reproducible environment. For every iteration we run, we have to uh, we have to uh, start from a specific, uh, a specific state uh, or reproducible state uh, because uh, otherwise the shrinking won't work. And we also want speed. Um, and the reason for that is that we basically just want to run as many tests as possible. Uh, it's not always necessary but um, the general rule is that uh, the more generated tests, uh, the better. And uh, these two at the end here, uh, they can uh, be pretty difficult to, um, to combine sometimes because uh, sometimes it takes a lot of uh, time and effort to um, build up to that, uh, uh, to that uh, specific uh, state you wanna start from. Uh, I would, if, if you run into that, I would uh, recommend using uh, Docker um, to, uh, to start from, um, um, to start, uh, just start a, a container for every iteration. So uh, that was, that was property-based testing. And um, just uh, let's move on to simulation testing. A few years ago, uh, Cognitech, or maybe the Datomic team specifically, I, I'm not sure, they uh, introduced something called simulation testing. And uh, the idea is that you uh, have some kind of stochastic model uh, that represents a user's behavior. Then you uh, generate a sequence of actions from that uh, model and uh, you perform those actions and uh, validate that everything works correctly at the end of the simulation. <clears throat> uh, I'm not going to be too picky about uh, doing things exactly like they do. Uh, I'm more interested in uh, just uh, simulating users and see what might come out of it. 
Um, and I think at the heart of that is uh, a stochastic model. I've used uh, Markov chains. And uh, so a Markov chain is a stochastic model uh, which uh, describes the probability uh, for reaching a specific state uh, depending on um, a previous state. So uh, these state uh, transitions are described using a transition matrix. And uh, we, we are going to, I'm going to show you a transition matrix soon. Um, and uh, what it describes is the uh, probability of reaching one straight from another. Um, but uh, first, I'm, I want to show you some applications of uh, Markov chains. They are uh, used for a lot of different things, uh, like uh, speech recognitions, uh, recognition, weather prediction, algorithmic music, uh, music composition, spam bots, can't forget about those, and uh, much, much more. <coughs> Sorry. But I'm gonna focus on <coughs> simulating users. <coughs> but <coughs> before that, we are going to use them for fun. It's not that they are specifically useful for just uh, spam bots. It's more that uh, they can produce um, pretty realistic text. So from uh, a text source, any given text source, you can build a transition matrix. And uh, from that uh, transition matrix, you can generate new text, which sometimes looks very realistic. And uh, you have all interacted with spam bots, spam bots, so sometimes not that uh, that uh, realistic. So, Mr. Trump is a pretty prolific tweeter. I took his 500 latest tweets and uh, generated 100 new tweets. And uh, <laughs> this one was my favorite. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's uh, some pretty interesting insight. Let's look at another one. <clears throat> Since we are kind of in the culinary world here with our ice creams, who's, uh, who's, uh, who could possibly be better to post comments uh, <laughs> than a free Michelin star chef? So let's see what uh, Mr. Ramsey has to say about our ice cream. As a, as a home brewer, I would be very interested in seeing the specific <laughs> brewing process of that, but I, I don't think I would, try, uh, would like to try one. Um, anyway, uh, enough of that. This is um, a basic transition matrix. So um, let, let me help you with this. At the top, uh, we have something called navigate product list. And, uh, so you can see the keys on the left, uh, they are actions um, that our simulated using, uh, user is going to perform. And uh, the product list is uh, mapping to um, the uh, navigate random product action and the navigate next page uh, action. And then we have uh, something called weight, and that is basically our probability. So. Uh, from our product list, it's um, twice as likely that we are going to a random product from there than we are going to the next page. So if we follow uh, the next to the next action, um, let's say we, uh, we got to the next page, from there we can also go to a random product, or we could go to the next page or to the previous page. And uh, that this, uh, this, um, these transitions will uh, go on until the, at the end here, I'm not sure if uh, you can see this, but uh, at the end we have uh, an action called submit order and one called leave. And um, as you can see uh, at the keys uh, on the left, we don't have any actions for that, so that means that the simulation will end. 
there. So uh, let's look what uh, uh, let's have a look um, what this can look like. Yeah, and this this goes on for as long as we wanted to. Um, after we place that order, we will just run a new iteration or new stimulation. So uh, that is great, but why do we want to do this? Um, yeah, we can run some pretty interesting validations at the end of the test. Uh, for example, we might uh, see that uh, um, the price uh, every user um, uh, every user paid match uh, the actual money we uh, we have uh, right now as as the end of the simulation. Or, uh, but but that doesn't uh, stop us from running continuous assertions uh, along the way when we in the middle of a of a, um, a simulation. And uh, I think this is great for many different things, but one thing is concurrency. Uh, I, uh, I ran this test for maybe an hour or so with a single user, and uh, then I, I tried uh, two users uh, shopping at the same time, and uh, it took about a few minutes to uh, run into uh, uh, some problems there. And um, yeah, we can potentially run this indefinitely. So uh, in addition to having something like um, a staging area, we could have a simulation area and just run uh, these simulations uh, all the time. So when we uh, want to uh, push new code or m do data migration migrations, we, uh, we can uh, run it in our simulation area first and see that things actually work. So those are great things, and um, but I, I think there is a problem with both uh, this kind of simulation testing and property-based testing. Uh, and how do we know what to test? Uh, it's not obvious, because isn't property-based testing just another kind of example-based testing? Because instead of uh, having to come up with examples of input, we have to come up with examples of properties or validations. Uh, and that, there's nothing weird about that. That's just the things are. Um, and um, I, I don't think uh, the question, uh, the answer to this is probably that we don't know. Uh, so to help with that, I think that we need, uh, we need tools to uh, explore and analyze our systems. So uh, since we're talking about user faces in today, uh, today, what if after a simulation we could just go over all the different states in our user interface and, uh, but by dragging a slider? Um, yeah, we better align those buttons. Maybe we hadn't uh, thought about that before uh, because we didn't uh, we didn't um, put that many items in our cart. Uh, so we we have no idea what we're looking for, but we are going to find stuff, and uh, we can run this test for an hour or something, and then just quickly and easily uh, go through all the different states by just dragging a slider. Or maybe it would be something like this. Let's run a test for uh, some amount of time and see if we are dropping frames. And uh, yeah, it looks like we did at the beginning there. Let's go back to our, uh, to our time traveling tool and uh, see what was really going on there. And it doesn't necessarily have to be about user interfaces. It could be um, the database, for example. Um, let, let's make a graph with uh, all the all the different states of stock in a, for a product during a simulation, and uh, we can see here that we have a problem here. 
because the stock is obviously below zero and that's not possible. And that was the problem I was talking about earlier with two users uh, shopping at the same time. Um, and um, I mean, looking at just one product might not be that effective. We could have a 10,000 um, products um, in, um, shown in this, uh, same, uh, in this same chart. So uh, what, do we know, what, do, uh, what do you need to this, do this kind of testing? You need a uh, selenium here too. And uh, you need some kind of stochastic model. Um, I used markup chains with um, Craig and Darius library, Cosatom. And um, it's, um, I put Docker in parentheses because it's not needed, but it's going to help you. Uh, and uh, also Datomic, not, not necessary at all, but uh, it will make your life easier. And uh, yeah, Datomic is a great fit for this. Uh, but more importantly, you need uh, creativity. And um, it doesn't necessarily have to be us, the programmers, doing uh, these, uh, these uh, simulations. I think that uh, this could be a great fit for QA uh, people, for example. Uh, because I think that a QA team really shines when they get to uh, come with new insight or uh, question uh, specifications or implementations. But all too often, we waste QI resources on um, reproducing bugs or uh, trying to find new bugs. But that's obviously things that we can do, that we can automate uh, ourselves for most of the time. So um, I think that we should uh, um, make better use of QA people. So to sum things up, um, use example-based testing for sanity checks and uh, catching regressions. Use property-based testing for, to catch uh, even more regressions and uh, find new bugs and uh, reproduce, uh, reproduce them. And uh, simulate your uses to find even more bugs and more importantly, to explore and analyze your system. And yeah, get creative with testing. You will win a lot from this. And uh, don't mess with Gandhi when you play Civilization. Thank you so much. Hello. Any questions? Yes. Okay, uh, I'm gonna come to you. I'm gonna... Um, where can we see the code for this you've written? Is, is that available somewhere? Okay. How, how do I get started with this? Because it sounds really interesting and I would yeah. like to use this. Yeah, I wish that this is uh, part of um, some uh, <laughs> messy environment I have. I would like to break out the parts that make sense into a framework or something like that, or library. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I think that um, it will be hard to not constrain the users. So um, um, I think that eventually we will probably see some kind of library for uh, or uh, environment around doing this kind of testing. But right now, I don't need of any. Uh, I don't know of any. Uh, so um, it's a. Uh, it's a lot of uh, just uh, pulling libraries together, and uh, yeah. If you it, does that answer the question? Um, yeah, it does. Kind of. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. Okay, uh, that's good. I, I will uh, probably try to uh, put up a blog post uh, sometime. That, that, that'd be great. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> Yeah, more or less related to that, the time traveling thing, is that still part of um, this project? Only? Uh, yeah, um, I used, um, I didn't use Ohm, uh, but something very similar uh, um, in here. And it's a very, very um, easily, easily implemented thing if you are using something like Ohm. Um, because we do have 
we do have, uh, it's basically just recording all, all states you run into uh, during, uh, during the time of your user interface. And um, I'll put that in a blog post. <laughs> And yeah. another thing, um, considering a Selenium is actually quite slow. For, for example, when you found that bug, would you stop running that particular test, or do you keep running all these uh, kind of checks anyway? Uh, you mean for, uh, for, for a real uh, application? When you suppose you found the bug with the less sign? Yeah, uh, that that kind of depends. Um, if you are trying to reproduce a bug, you probably don't uh, make it as part of your test suite. Um, you, you just uh, write the test and uh, go away and get some coffee or something and uh, look at the results after. But if you uh, want, want to find new bugs, you can run it overnight or yeah, indefinitely. And if you would run into a bug, you wouldn't stop. You would just uh, continue and uh, have some kind of reporting uh, to say that, yeah, at this uh, specific time with this specific state, we ran into an issue. And then last thing, I, I thought the bug was actually the fact that the ice cream, chocolate ice cream was on the page, but it was written strawberry. <laughs> but that was not intentional. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think you nice talk. I was I was wondering uh, with these automated test frameworks, also a lot of maintaining those test frameworks uh, uh, happen. H how was that with this uh, effort you uh, you did? So you showed finding one bug, the the, the smaller than sign. Uh, did you yeah. find a lot of other bugs? Did you find a lot of regression and, and maintenance cost? Can you say something about that? Uh, so the the question was, uh, did I find more bugs than this? Yeah, I is did. it worth yeah. setting up such a automated uh, test environment? It's a lot of fun. I, uh, I definitely yeah, I, <laughs> it is a lot of fun. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I found more bugs, and uh, I've actually used it in um, in environments uh, that where they don't for clients uh, where they don't have this kind of uh, testing implemented. Um, but it's it's pretty easy to um, implement a simple version of this, and uh, you have to find bugs. And you know the, the stakeholders they will think that you are really smart. Yeah, you can uh, think of all these scenarios, but uh, in in reality, I'm just using a, a, um, a generative uh, testing thing. So. Okay. I think that's all we have time for the questions. Uh, I think it'll be fun to have like generatively testing bugs and then generatively testing them and generating them. So one piece of code is generating bugs, another piece of code is testing it. So then they can yeah. have like a yeah. bot chat or bot fight or <laughs> that'll be fun. Um, okay, so we have um, 10 minutes.